for the avoidance of doubts, the equality is equity principle ought not be applied to a wife, however wealthy she might be. That is, even if she is richer or wealthier than the husband. Thus, this is the surest way to save most marriages, which are tearing apart principally because of issues about who is entitled to which property and by what percentage, whether or not a wife or wives will share their wealth with their husbands should be left to their sense of generosity and magnanimity. In other words, any law that compels married women to compulsorily share with their husband any property acquired by them during the subs subsistence of the marriage with or without the support of their husband is retrogressive and ought to be removed from our statute books or departed from if it is a binding decision of the courts. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back engaging the author of this particular quotation. The head of the Ghana School of Law and Legal Education. He believes that when it comes to property and distribution of same, when there is an issue in the marriage, the man's property ought to be the one to be affected. If the woman has acquired whatever wealth, they should keep it. It's controversial. And it's got many of you talking already. This is the law. It's your legal light. It's your help law. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. This is the law. It's your legal light. It's your help law. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. And this afternoon, we are very privileged once again to be hosting Berima Nanayao Kodie Opong, who is the Director of Legal Education and Director Ghana School of Law. We are going to talk about an issue that we have discussed a couple of times here, but from a different perspective. What happens to property in marriage when the marriage goes wrong? Who must get what? There is a principle that's been known and advanced, including by our courts. Equality is equity. He comes in with the his principle, which we have codenamed the equality uh, is equity cordiers principle. Thank you very much for making time to join us this afternoon once again. I'm graceful. Great. Good to have you. Good to have you. It's a relish. Right. Uh, great. Yes. Great. Great. Mm. Now, but you know, on such a day, we cannot begin this discussion without talking about the law school or the school of law. And there are people who have been very excited about the numbers that have just been called to the bar two days ago and the numbers that have also gained access to begin their education, legal education in the Ghana School of Law. Many of you have asked that. We should ask him questions about that. Is it questions we should ask him or we should be celebrating him about that? There are people on social media, including, including Justice Fremsai, Dr. Justice Fremsai, who have taken time to celebrate our guest for the transformation that has happened in the Ghana School of Law. But there are some who also say it could be better because they are in excess of 2,000 who didn't get access after the entrance exams? Where should they go? Professor Kokuaza has interesting views. We'll ask him what he thinks about that as well. So once again, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm grateful. So you must be a very happy person, as in the legal fraternity, many are happy with you and celebrating you for the huge numbers, over a thousand being called and an equal number going through the entrance and getting ready to start legal education. 
Yes, um, thank you very much and um, good afternoon. And uh, I dedicate this, if you permit me, to my hardworking staff. Um, everybody knows that I put the janitors, that's mm. the cleaners above all. Because mm. they put the place in shape and make the pl place clean for us before we can start work. Then my um, hardworking uh, deputies, uh, that's the registrar and the deputy registrar, the rest of the hard-working team, the lecturers, and of course the students, they also allow themselves to receive the instructions that we give them. And we are very grateful to God above all for how far he had brought us. So until last year, <laughs> the highest number that had um, become lawyers, uh, the students from Ghana School of Law that became lawyers, were in 2020, they were about 450. 46 or thereabout. Now, then and last year... That was celebrated as huge. Huge, yes. Then last year, it reduced over a couple of years. And then last year, it got to 846. And that got a massive celebration. Yes. In fact, um, <laughs> that is when two of the personalities, the candidates, unfortunately, didn't comply with the Rubin mm -hmm. ethics and they had to be denied. Right. So those that were actually called were 844, even though 846 were in the room. Okay. And that is also a discussion for another time, for mm -hmm. those who may not understand what exactly we do on the day of the call. I say that it's an individual application that you make, as if you are making an application in court. Mm -hmm. It can be granted or dismissed. And that is what happens. It doesn't so, matter that you have passed your exams. No, no that is one stage. Then the other stage is about compliance with rules, the ethics. Because so there's, a, there's a character criteria. That is right. Which you actually make them swear an affidavit yeah. before they come in. Yes. Yes. And, and it is by law. The law says that. Mm. And I, I checked, you see, also in the Medical and Dental Act. I mean, it has a full name. Mm. And that also requires that you also comply with ethical rules. So we are very happy. We are very excited that... 1,097 of our students exited. And I will the view Unprecedented. that... Unprecedented. Yes, well, I mean, so that's about 30% of about 25% more than last year. Right. And remember, I mean, last year we also had the mini call that gave us 195. Mm -hmm. And this year we have a few that will also be called by uh, May on the whole... And within two years, we've called about 2,000 plus lawyers. Mm. And I think we, are, we all have to celebrate ourselves. We've all done well, especially members of council, very progressive in my view. They have really opened the way for us to be able to get these students leave. So as we crave for more students to enter, they must definitely leave, exit. And then because the view is that the law school it's just a holding area, a holding institution, mm. a transitional institution. No one comes there to stay there. It's not a military camp or barracks. I'm looking at the brochure yeah. in which you put the first batch yeah. of those who were called to the bar. That's right. The pioneer class of Ghana School of Law called to the bar on the 22nd of June 1963. That's right. And they were just nine. They were nine. But they entered? Yes. About 600 entered. Then they did the way to enter. They did the entrance exams. And I'm only 97 qualified. So we are even doing better now. 97 qualified. <laughs> yes. And at the end of the day, at the end only of the nine. Day, some still fell out. Right. Mainly academic because. Mm. The initial idea by Kwame Nkrumah, the, our first president, doctor, was that the members of parliament, civil servants, public servants, business uh, personalities, should be given the opportunity to study the professional law. Mm -hmm. Because previously, they were all going to the UK and so on. And he thinks that we're not producing enough. And that, in his, um, based on his philosophy, that a black man is capable of managing his own affairs, he established the Ghana School of Law and I think the medical school too right. in Accra. Mm. So, yes, and I've quoted him um, extensively on the day when he, he opened 
that is the, the, the first bat were called to the bar. And sadly, the last person joined the majority or died just last August. That's, That's right. Our friend, Baraman Williams' father. That's He's right. So rest in mm. perfect peace. Mm. So there were actually 10. Kokuba, a good old Kokuba, and mm. understand there was some issue unrelated to Ghana School of Law. I think purely political or so. You should forgive me if mm. I'm not getting it right. But, All right. And so he was not uh, able to join his colleagues that year to be called to the bar. That way they would have been 10. The question that is being asked is that if you can graduate or call as many as 1,097 to the bar this year, it means that you have the capacity to be calling such numbers. If you have admitted how many again after this the entrance? Time, yes. It's 964. Almost a thousand. Almost a thousand. Then it means you have the capacity to do such numbers. Why are you not doing it? Well, in the first place, I have, I'm on record several times that if, for example, all the 2,700 plus that wrote the entrance exams were lucky or were able to pass, mm -hmm. who provides accommodation for them? Because contrary to the conventional belief that the Ghana School of Law is only at Makola, we have the Makola, yes, the main campus. We host mainly the final years. Mm -hmm. And when there's a, a spillover, as it were, we take them to Gimpa. There are some to in KNUST. That's right. So we have the main campus at Makola. We have KNUST. UPSC alone takes about 600 students. Mm -hmm. And so, and in fact, two years ago when we needed more spaces, we got a place in Legon. Except that, um, they should forgive me, but I have to say that the rent they were charging were beyond our means. Yeah. So we had to now move. If they had passed, and we had to get a place at Legon. So the, or the idea really is that all UPSA students can decide to stay on UPSA campus. Just choose the, the Ghana School of Law campus there. Mm -hmm. All those from Legon, if we are to go back, will then just transit to Legon. KNUST, from the KNUC Law School, the same campus, you transit okay. and you go to the, the new block that the school had offered us, which you are renting. The same for Gimpa. So these four, or potentially four if you add Legon, right. public schools where law is taught, as it were, we, are, we have our presence there. So it is not as if anybody... There is a deliberate effort to cut the numbers. And brother, I can tell you that there are council members whose children fill the exams. Yeah. In fact, one of them this year told me, my daughter is going to write, but I'm not very sure, so I've also registered her for, Gim for Gambia. Mm. But if there was an opportunity, you think someone will love somebody else's child more than you. And there you, are... You know, men. when I heard about a circumstance where even the chief justice then... Yes. Just a senior yeah. boy. Had to get his... No, two of his children. Two of his children to go and do it elsewhere because they couldn't enter here. That is the case. You will not even know who is who. Is your, is your, are your standards not too high? Because, well, because they go elsewhere and they enter easily and they turn out to become the best students there. Oh, yes. That, that's a fact. In fact, the person who was the best post-call student just two days ago, was also the best student in Gambia here. Okay. But they said that here because of patriotism, somebody else was giving a bit of them above her. So, but she, so again, so you are mentioning that the person is a post call. Yes. Meaning the person for, for not being able to enter here potentially yes. went to Gambia. Yes. Did there and finished. Yes. And came to do post call. Yes. Where there's no entrance exam. No. They just interview. Exactly. And the person did seven subjects, right. including constitutional law and legal system. It's possible the person may have even written here in the entrance and yes. didn't get it. Yes. Therefore, but went to Gambia. A substantial number of them write, try the entrance exam, and they are all successful. They go there, they come back. I won't say all of them go right. through successfully mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. but I mean, there's 80% or more of them come back, meet the very students, their own mates, yes. that they couldn't start with here, because they do one year in Gambia. And then they come back here, and within seven months, they become lawyers. Mm. The argument for and against can still be discussed. Mm. But the, the, the point really is that there is no deliberate policy that restricts access 
to the Ghana School of Law. I wouldn't have been here mm -hmm. as a lawyer anyway. Right. And I can tell you just to conclude that when you do assessment of wealth and uh, value in terms of wealth, there are quite a large number of people who had to depend on the scholarship we got for them from the scholarship secretariat right. before they were able to pay their fees or examination fees. But you and, think that and this is a new development yes, under your regime we, where we, you are seeking scholarship for those who yes. cannot afford but are qualified to do we, the We law. actually have an agreement, an MOU, mm. with scholarship secretariat. Mm. In the meantime, they will advance 500,000 Ghana cities to our students. And I ask the students, some students, to just handpick their own colleagues they know they are in need. Mm. Not needy. We have a concept in need of these facilities as and when. And they got us 100 people. Some needed 10,000. We have been given some 4,000, some 2,000. And the point is that if there was a deliberate effort to cut the numbers, then the wealthy, those who are rich and the powerful, will have their children qualifying. Mm -hmm. If I should tell you the number of messages, calls I received on the day that the publication was done about the entrance there. And even a few weeks before, I mean, these are coming from very powerful people. Mm. And yet, their children couldn't pass and they couldn't enter. So we have a cross-section of people in the school now. And the, the school and the profession has become so attractive that nearly every professional wants to enter. Mm. Medical doctors, pharmacists, even paramount chiefs, mm. Um, consultant, top police officers, politicians mm. abound, yeah. Mil top military officers, they are all coming to the Ghana School of Law. Mm. Even those who have retired still want to learn at the school. And, and so you cannot have any evidence, in my view, and there is none, mm. that anybody deliberately wants to restrict. I say, in fact, when exams are written, and this time, I can say, if I'm, I hope I'm permitted, that Ghana School of Law, for example, had nothing to do with the entrance exams in terms of certain questions and marking. It was rather some people from the various universities that were involved in the assessment, in the moderation, just to see to the extent to which they themselves will recommend their own students. And I can tell you that sometimes when we, they are not involved or council is not involved legitimately, the numbers would have been far, far low. Okay. And this is assessment by their own lecturers through the entrance exam. Thank you. Thank you very much. But there's another development that is coming up. I know our time is running because people are <laughs> eager and well, ready always come back. and ready to <laughs> maul you, uh, especially some of the men, yes. for suggesting what you are putting up. Yeah. Um, uh, the other problem that is coming up, it is a problem we know that exists elsewhere in, in the UK. Right. People have finished the law school. They, they have been called to the bar. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a requirement for them to do the mandatory six months of pupillage, pupillage. but they can't find a place to do that pupillage. Therefore, they will not get a practice license to begin to practice the law. What, how are you, you know, thinking about that? I have provided the answer partially, if mm. I may say so. And I can say on authority here that the Ghana School of Law has a legal department. We have lawyers, mainly lecturers, who are prepared to receive some of these students and train them as pupils. Mm -hmm. In fact, we receive some whom we train for the internship. Right. So if there's any student who has just become a lawyer mm -hmm. and doesn't have a place to do pupillage, I am saying on authority, they should just write to us. Okay. There are some lawyers who don't even know how to attract them. They come to us. We can also do so. But you see that a large number of them are choosing. Mm -hmm. They prefer law firms that are famous. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't like to come to your opponent's chambers. Oh, I come mean, on. Not a, <laughs> come <one> on. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> right. Well, mm. so... If they are willing, mm. and it's, it's, it's okay because the, the law specifies who is qualified to receive a pupil. Mm. Once the person qualifies, 
I will urge them to go and start however humble, if you like, the environment is. Yes. You never know. Mm. You can then even become a part of it, not just for the people. Right. So if there's anybody who, and you are going to put up a, uh, on the platform, if there's any, I've already asked the um, SRC president to tell them, whoever wants to come to my chambers or the Ghana School of Law chambers, to write their names. This is just about three days ago, even before they were called to the bar. So it's not a problem, but also we don't want to go to the villages. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go to the districts. <laughs> we don't want to go to the regions. When that is also part of the reason we must train a that lot more right. lawyers. And these beautiful pictures are on social media, as you can see. Yes. That's A. Sankoma and three of his children. Uh, all of them have become lawyers. Two of them were called yes, on uh, uh, Friday. Friday yes. And then there is also the Fixin O mm. uh, family. Three boys, yes. three guys, yes. all called to the bar, yes. same day. Yes. So the people were asking, ah, but how come three people from the same family, they, make, they get access and get called to the bar, and one person is struggling to get in, they can't get it? Well, that's what I'm saying. It has nothing to do with any deliberate policy. Mm. It is just by the effort, and I think by the grace of God. I mean, the, the ACE's two daughters were my students in the post -corps. Very okay. brilliant, mm -hmm. hard-working personalities. It, it, until I went to the law school. post -corps. Yes. That also means that they, they perhaps didn't attempt your entrance exams for not being sure that they would get it. And then they went and did it somewhere yes. else and then came for post -corps where they won't have to write an entrance, entrance exam. exam. Yes. So, well, so that is also coming up. I mean... Um, but for the entrance, we interview. Mm -hmm. And if you are not successful at the interview, we drop you. That may not be an exam, but it's a form of a mechanism to assess the right. student. And right. there have been instances where yeah. at the interview, some people had been dropped from who wanted to go through the post call session. But I'm saying that until I went to the school, I never, I thought that the general view that um, well, we call them children or students mm -hmm. of these days are lazy. I wouldn't have known that there, it was an exception at the law school. Mm -hmm. And you can ask any postcard student in particular. The final system is so rigorous mm -hmm. that it's incomparable in many of the universities they attended in London and the US and, and, and Canada and elsewhere. I, I, look, it, it, it's so regimented that, I mean, you just cannot find the briefing space. And until your results are published, the anxiety <laughs> and the pure sense of uh, despondency is immeasurable. So it, 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 and, and just to conclude, if you can ask any of those who got some of our students for intention. I did. Across board. I, I take up a, a maximum of four yes. every year. And I, I, and I can tell the anxiety is just palpable. Yes. But you can also tell that their competence is at least at the level where they can enter. That's so, right. I say that, if you can forgive me, uh, the principle mm. is just like mm. the iPhone principle. Produce more, but it should be quality. Right. And I got a call from one top personality who cannot be easily convinced about a position of law, which, I mean, she doesn't share, but it means that hey, she has so much knowledge and skill. He, she called me and said, well, I stopped taking students from law school, but last year, those are two really surprised me. It mm -hmm. means you guys are doing well. Right. And it's across board. So nobody should just ridicule the numbers and say, oh, the law school has become cheap and so on. These are students that you can engage them on one-on-one -on -one and you'll be amazed at how much knowledge and skill they have acquired. Okay. Thanks to our lecturers as well. Thank you very much. Um, that is the director, legal education, and director of the Ghana School of Law, um, Berima Yao Kodie um, Opon, Berima Nana Yao Kodie Opon, director of legal education and director Ghana School of Law. We'll take a quick break, and then when we return, we will be getting to the subject that you are itchy, you know, to hear about. We should find another time to yeah. discuss a lot more about this particular subject oh, because yeah. I know there are many people who are also interested in 
Um, we'll this one as well. Okay. okay. But I think congratulations are in order. Thank you. And you guys are doing a good job. We, we hope that the numbers can continue to appreciate the way they, they have been going up. Yes, yes. Right. We said that mm. we won't ask lawyers in particular to come and support us. The mm. same mm. thing that motivates them to go to their secondary schools yeah. to expand the infrastructure. <laughs> because the number of mm. the students coming are lawyers' children. That's but right. They don't come to help. Okay, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. <laughs> You're welcome back. And in my introduction, I read an excerpt. <clears throat> I'm going to read that again to put our discussion in perspective. At the Ghana Bar Association Conference, annual conference this year, he presented a paper, a 26-page paper, and made an argument to the end that he says, for the avoidance of doubt, the equality is equity principle ought not be applied to a wife. <clears throat> However wealthy she might be, that is, even if she is richer or wealthier than the husband. Thus, this is the surest way to save most marriages, which are tearing apart, principally because of issues about who is entitled to which property and by what percentage. Whether or not a wife or wives will share their wealth with their husbands should be left to their sense of generosity and magnanimity. In other words, any law that compels married women to compulsorily share with their husband any property acquired by them during the subsistence of the marriage with or without the support of their husband is retrogressive and ought to be removed from our statute books or departed from if it is a binding decision of the court. Then he ended that this recommendation is, however, subject to the applicability of the fault principle. The person whose conduct engenders dissolution of the marriage must not take the full benefit for it. <laughs> Already, yes. once we put out our flyer and people got to know that this was the discussion in perspective, we have received messages and I don't remember seeing one that is in favor of this proposition. Where are you coming from? From the point where the wife was required to have shown that she had made contribution to the property yes. before she would get a share. Mm -hmm. To the point where the Supreme Court says, well, all the chores that the wife even does for you, we can quantify that mm -hmm. in monetary terms. So yeah. she deserves to get a portion of the property. Yeah. And then you say, the equality is equity principle. This is the Cordier perspective. Yes. Justify this. Well, that's what you have, um, Ibli. Uh, re represented, I read to the viewers. Um, so after the paper, I also received a number of messages, <laughs> and then even personal. Right. And I call it um, condemnation by men, recommendation <laughs> by women. Uh, commend, co commendation by women, condemnation by, by men. men. But one particular personality, very huge personality, who was a key member of those who drafted our constitution, sent a message to one of his grandsons, who is also an outstanding lawyer, that I never thought that Article 22 was drafted for men, or for the benefit of men, instead of the women. And that this is the first time his attention has drawn to it, that traditional, and he's a traditional man, a very important paramount chief, that traditionally, customarily, it is an abomination, like I, I discussed, for a man to just stand in the presence of his in-laws and say that, yes, my wife is diseased, my wife is dead. Don't you know that under Article 22 or PNDC Law 111 or even during my, my, my divorce, Matrimonial Causes Act, Article 22, I have a right 
to a reasonable share in the estate of my wife when it's about death, or I have a right to equal share, or as a quantum that is determinable mm. of the property of my wife. I want someone to just tell me, how many communities in this country, if at all, can this be tolerated? So, because the point really is that, and I said that from the days of Adam, God assigned responsibilities. That you, the man, should sweat, till the land, and have food. And after you have also gone to bring somebody else's daughter to your house, you feed that person and the children. It is for the woman to also carry the baby for nine months or more if she's not lucky. And she will go through travel until she gives birth. These are distinct responsibilities God gave to us. And that is why it is not a woman that should go to another person's wife to marry a man, at least. The dominant position is the opposite. But the idea that now people go to other people's house, take their daughter, and you now enter into a joint venture with her. Use your money to buy food or use a chop money. I will use mine to build a house. And when there is dispute, you say, show me your contribution. In actual fact, under custom, the same. That is why even upon the death of a man, there is responsibility imposed on the members of that man's family to continue to provide for the wife and children in terms of their maintenance and all the necessaries of life. There is no such responsibility on a woman that when your husband dies, you or the customary successor of yours will then now take care of, of, of the man. So in the face of this, I'm saying that any law that has recently been crafted, and I didn't know that now even the understanding is that it was actually done for men, substantially, mm. because we are the ones that traditionally we cannot be entitled to property of a woman. Let's read Article 22 in perspective, right. and then he'll explain further. And then also, you did this in the face of the Land Act, which is yes. a new law, yes. which appears to also uh, somewhat, you know, uh, tilt towards the, 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 the perspective from which you come. Now, Article 22 of the 1992 Constitution says, property rights of spouses. A person shall not be deprived of a reasonable provision out of the estate of a spouse, whether or not the spouse died having made a will. Parliament shall, as soon as practicable, after the coming into force of this constitution, enact legislation regulating the property rights of spouses. We have tried, we have not been able to do that. Mm. So it is said that the property rights, they smuggle some of it into the Land Act. <laughs> Clause 3. With a view to achieving the full realization of the rights referred to in Clause 2 of this article, A. Spouses shall have equal access to property jointly acquired during marriage. And this is the one that is prominently known. Spouses shall have equal access to property jointly acquired during marriage. B. Assets which are jointly acquired during marriage shall be distributed equitably between the spouses upon the dissolution of the marriage. So why do you say this was made for the men? Well, as I said, even one of those who was prominent in drafting said that he never even, he had, he said, I think, in fact, he had not adverted his mind to the fact that it, it not, not that it was exclusively drafted for men, mm. but it favors the men even more than the women. As I said, traditionally, a woman has always been entitled to part of the estate of the husband, traditionally, during divorce. Even if it's the woman who is divorcing, they say, sumuno. It is rather the man who will be asked, generally, to at least provide some compensation. Sumuno, alimony. Sumuno, alimony, yes. Provide some compensation for the woman. You understand? So that has always been the case. And I'm saying that if we go back to first principles, from the days of Adam, 
up to customary law, up to the areas where we were still struggling for this situation. If we just concentrate on the fact that it is, uh, that is what some people misunderstood Oleinu in the Kote and Mate case. Mm. It is the responsibility of a man to provide for the necessities of life, maintenance for his wife and children. There is no corresponding duty on a woman. If the woman decides to do so, I'm saying that it is just by way of generosity and her own sense of magnanimity. magnanimity. And this is the reason why, in my view, and I've asked, Parliament is not even able to comply with this mandatory provision of the Constitution. At least that is what, and this law, this bill, was drafted as far back, I understand, as 208, when a, Dogati uh, was there. Uh, uh, spousal property bill. Yes, mm. and for, almost, for 30 years now, or, um, since the Constitution said we should do so as, as soon as it's practicable, we are struggling. Mm -hmm. Other laws have been passed with alacrity. Why is this one not being passed? And I'm saying that now you go to court in divorce proceedings, and it is found so, quote and unquote, forgive me, but nauseating, mm. that men are now emboldened to openly demand equal share or a reasonable share in the property of their wife. That is an aberration. Because wives are wealthy, wives are richer. It's not the, the time when the man had the opportunity to make wealth and the woman did it. These days, women, some women are the breadwinners. They go out and bring the most money. So the property in the family, much of it is made by that woman. Why should that man not be equally entitled in the same way that if the man were the one who was richer and had made all the property, the woman would be entitled. But then the woman is playing double role because these men generally don't even also play the role of a woman. Why don't they also now stay at home, build their children, cook, support whatever domestic um, chores that they are to engage in? They still let the woman see that, look here, I am the one that paid your, 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 your bride price. And so I continue to be your husband. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that, as far as I'm concerned, if we go back to the first principles and the customary law and so on, when it is an abomination, and, and even now, and I, I use the uh, illustration loosely, if you're a man, just like this jacket, if the button is chained to the left, and I was sitting here with it, I would be laughed at, I would be ridiculed. Because it's a woman's dress, but women can wear a dress. Why don't we ridicule them? Mm. So the general position, I'm not saying that that is um, the law of, of, of the constitution is supreme, but I'm saying that until we look at it again, we are not going to even be successful in passing a new law. So help us, let's go back a bit. What has been the law, the jurisprudence, the legal position in Ghana when it comes to uh, matrimonial property distribution when there's a dissolution of the marriage. How, where have we come from, which you discuss, you know, chronologically before you come to your position? Yeah, so um, let's understand first of all that customary law is part of the laws of Ghana. It's not just a source of law, it's part of the laws of Ghana. According to Article 11. Article 11, thank you. And so I start from customary law and I have highlighted it that the dominant position of customary law. And I'm saying that I'm prepared to um, educate myself. Mm. If there is any dominant position other than this, that a man can just stand in the presence of, say, his in-laws and, and boastfully demand for a share in the property of the wife. Even when you give me an example, I can say that is not the dominant position in Ghana. Mm. Most communities. In some communities, the insults, and the vulgar words they will use against you will be enough for you to shut up as a man, demanding part of the property of a woman. So uh, customary law does not support that kind of aberrant conduct, as I put it. Then also, I related it to the days of Adam, which in most cases we say that the origin of our laws is the original law and natural law 
the law of God, and so on. That I've also said that generally doesn't support that conduct. Then, over time, our court started to entertain other principles. So, um, it, could, it then started from contribution. Substantial contribution. Yes. First, contribution, then substantial. Then that one, you have to show, for example, that when the property was being built, the woman was going to the site to provide kinky and water for the workers, the mm -hmm. foreman and the masons and so on. In fact, she was the one that was buying the cement with the money of the husband anyway. She was running errands and so on. These were the thing, sort of things that you Or that there was some agreement that she would use her money yes. to take care of the home yes, the while money. The, man, the man uses his money to do the building. Building. Okay. Yes, the chop money or principle. Or to do the property, not, yes. let's not say building. Yes, mm. the chop money principle, as I call it. Mm -hmm. Then it was realized that a lot of times, the women in particular were unable to establish these facts. Mm -hmm. They don't have the evidence. Because in a matrimonial setting, you don't go about keeping receipts mm -hmm. or other uh, concrete evidence. Unless you have a view to divorcing. Mm -hmm. That's what they say that a woman who doesn't want to remain in marriage for long, when he takes the cassava from the ground, she doesn't plant again. Because mm. she knows that very soon <laughs> she will divorce. But if you know that you are not going to go through divorce very soon, why should you be in the habit of even keeping receipts? And the absence of that amounted to the fact that she was unable to substantiate the fact that she made contribution and was denied. And mainly, it was in the case of a woman, All right. the wife. Then when the substantial contribution was also found not to be um, not, not, uh, in accordance with not justice. to be fair, yes. And fairness. Mm. Then the equality is equity started developing. What does it, that mean? It had always been in our constitution mm. until sometime in 2010. When a case came to court, the famous Mensa and Mensa. But I say that from the facts of the case, the equality is equity principle didn't have to be invoked at all. Mm. Because there was sufficient evidence that the woman who was married to a public servant in Accra would go to the rural areas, buy Zomi, red oil, gari, plantain, and bring it to around the ministries where the husband was working. And the husband will get some of his friends. Oh, you can purchase some on credit. At the end of the month, I'll take the money from you. So it became like a credit sort of thing. And the woman continued to bring these with her own money substantially. Then eventually, there is divorce. Properties have been acquired, including companies, enterprises, and so on. Then she was asked to show evidence that, in fact, she made any contribution. I mean, you don't need equality is equity to establish that at least if you want to go by even the substantial contribution principle, she has done more than what was substantial. In fact, she made more contribution than the man in establishing these properties. But at least it was applied then. And there, the Supreme Court said that, well, Parliament has been asked about 20 years earlier to take steps to pass a law it's obvious it is not being done, and so we, the Supreme Court, we will not wait for them. I have, the gap. I have expressed <laughs> my own um, criticism of, of it, uh, that we should also be careful not to also invade the, um, the territories of the, of the second arm of, of state when they've been given um, that opportunity, because the Supreme Court can even compel Parliament, mm -hmm. in a way, if there's a matter before them, and that, that, that's, that's it. So, All right. we got the equality is equity principle. So, mm -hmm. we had Mensa and Mensa, then came Kwasin and Kwasin on similar, and then Kwasin said, No, yes, equality is equity, but we should be very careful not to violate a very important constitutional provision, Article 18, that a person may acquire property either by himself that is alone, or in association with others. Mm -hmm. If we give a blanket check that once the property is acquired during the subsistence of the marriage, then automatically a per the other spouse also has an equal share. It may be unfair. Mm -hmm. From then on, Arthur and Arthur came, it completely ignored this proviso in the question and question case, right. and also went back to 
Mensa and Mensa, and then the famous Finn and Finn. I will urge those who read the cases, go back to the law report and examine the personalities of the judges. It is this place that we don't have that jurisdiction, the, uh, jurisprudence. Mm. Elsewhere, you will see certain lines running through some of these cases. And there's nothing wrong with it. Mm. Sometimes mm. religious, social, economic inclinations. And, and what, what's your argument when you bring in Parliament's sort of intrusion somehow in 2020 by the Land Act? Yes. And the provisions that were made that have been talked about by many people about the presumption that once the property is acquired during the marriage, the man doesn't even have the right or either spouse. Yes. You don't have the right to dispose of the property no. without the written consent of the other spouse. In fact, when you are going to register and they even suspect that you are married, mm -hmm. They will register it in the name of the two spouses, not just in your name alone. Because the law says so. Because the law says so. Until you prove that, no, my wife has, has agreed that this one is mine alone. But that doesn't completely satisfy the requirement under Article 22, as we have spoken My about. wife has agreed, or I have shown enough documentation that, in fact, it is mine, and it was not acquired in, for the two of us. Well, the presumption is that once it was acquired during marriage, it's then matrimonial it's matrimonial. Property. It is, the presumption is then rebuttable by you. Okay. You, the person saying, it is not jointly acquired. Mm -hmm. It's not the duty of the wife to even give evidence now mm -hmm. on this generally. Mm -hmm. So when you move from there and then you consider it in its totality, that's why I hold the view that it is just unfair because we know in our society, even though we have done better than many societies mm. in terms of acquisition of property by women, I think it is too regressive that now that gradually women are also able to leverage, we now bring in a law that says that once a man can show that a woman acquired property during the time of their marriage, then upon divorce, if he has some limited evidence that, in fact, he contributed to it. Some even say that, oh, uh, I sponsored her uh, further education right. uh, and training mm -hmm. or trade mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. Now she has become, let's say, a commander in the army, earning so much. So that is my contribution as a man. But why did you marry the woman if you are not to ensure the improvement in her status in life? especially economically, do you want the person to remain the same way? And that used to be the mentality of some men. They don't even want their wives so, so, to... So, so why do you say that claim to, <laughs> to some sort of equality in the property is not fair? If either spouse contributed so much to your progress, you know, by way of education and how you came to where you are and you are earning sufficiently to make the property that you want to say, that is my property. Why? I, I'm, I'm saying that, you see, even for the women, it's not as simple as that. When you also have a child who is a male, mm -hmm. <laughs> remember the same principle will apply to him as well. And so on and so forth. So my view, as I have stated, since there is no requirement that a woman should go to a man's house and marry her, I mean, marry that man, right. the responsibility is on the man solely to maintain the woman in her status in life together with well, children that will come out of it. And if a woman in the course of that acquires property, there shouldn't be any law that compels her to also share it with the man. But we know that they do it most times or all the time by generously committing themselves apart from the role they play as mothers to our own children they also provide the means many times they add to the job money we give them and so for me i think if the law is looked at again and if even for those who still think that equality is equity and when they they confront me and ask them 
do you really want your wife's property? Mm -hmm. Oh, you see, it's not me, but you see, for others whose wife may be rich. I said, no, so, but anybody you ask, that is what they tell you. Why don't we rather ensure that women advance further up to the level that we men in particular have, by our circumstance, been able to reach? And then we can think about a law which minimally may require a woman to make provision for the husband. So, and, and even that, I also insist that. So now your proposition is that the law that Parliament was supposed to make, that it has still not made, it should make it and state in very unambiguous terms that this is what it has to be. That is what I'm saying, yes. And, and, it is and, only the man's property that will be shared when the, the relationship or the marriage is dissolved. But that of the wife should be left to the wife's own generosity. Unless sense of the generosity. wife, by evidence, engendered the divorce by, for example, committing adultery or making it impossible for the marriage to be sustainable because she wants the property. And that can easily be ascertained. In that case, as I have concluded, that is the fault principle. Mm. Even though in UK and so on, they have now abolished the fault principle. We still have the fault principle in, in our statute books. So if, because then you are also careful not to encourage people coming into a marriage after a few years, then I'm leaving properties that are acquired, uh, the man's own. But I've also argued that the property that should be shared should be that which has already taken account of the amount of money the man has provided for maintenance for the children and then for himself minimally it is the bonus that he isn't he, he has to share with the wife but all that belongs to the wife should be kept for her according to your own generosity you couch that she can in give two statements yes. that by this proposition the man's property alone will be shared in accordance with legally founded discretion subject of course two conditions including one maintenance of issues of the marriage that's children, children till they attain the age of majority 18 correct or or even 23 in terms of education okay yes. and are in the position to maintain themselves yes two reasonable consideration is made regarding the man's responsibility to his extended family yes. who may have immensely contributed to the development of the man especially in his formative years yes was this to sort of placate the men who are not happy with your position well it's a balance because it is acknowledged that the man too it's somebody who helped them yes our mothers my mother had to sell her precious jewels and can take from her. She took them from a tight, you know, a tight. Mm -hmm. Yes, trunk. Because it's a tight. <laughs> right, yes. yeah. To sell it, mm. to take care of me. Right. You understand? That is what I'm saying. That So that aspect. So it's not a holistic sort of thing. When you take all this into account, then whatever is left should be shared according to the discretion of a judge because all whoever will be responsible for the dissolution, whether as family members or so. And then also on account of the man's own personal needs, he must drive some luxurious car that his means can afford generally. And then the rest can be shared with the wife, while the wife keeps her own to make herself happy and beautiful for you. What else do you want as a man? Interesting. Uh, if you just join I us. wish you can, you can publish it so people can yes. read it. In it okay, so we have the... We have the um, we have your permission oh, to yes. publish this. Oh, yes, please. Uh, yes, please. So it's a 26-page uh, presentation, a scholarly presentation that was made to lawyers at the uh, Ghana Bar Association's annual conference. And we have been talking to, uh, having a conversation with Berima Nanaya Kodia Opong. He's a director of legal education and director of the Ghana School of Law. And he... It's provoking all of us to begin to think whether the present uh, legal provisions or circumstance, how to distribute property when the marriage ends or is dissolved, is fair and does justice to the woman.
Thank you very much May for your time. May I just say one thing since you are closing. Uh, we are going for um, the celebration of life of our brother, Master Pukwa Jiman. Right. 60 years. He has mm. also done a lot for law school. He's now exiting. You know, we're still coercing to come. So you, we your predecessor. Yes, yes. Okay. So we acted um, before I got in. So right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again. This has been the law. It's your legal light. It's your health law. Let's continue to chew upon these uh, provoking uh, proposition and particularly for the attention of Parliament also. Have a good afternoon. I'm Samson Ladia Yenin.